Let's look at uh, an example for finding the scattering matrix of uh, a very useful device, one that we see oftentimes in uh, uh, microwave engineering, and that is simply a length of transmission line, a length L of transmission line. So this isn't a two-port device that has um, uh, you know, lumped elements in it. This is a two-port device that involves a distributed element, one distributed element, a length of transmission line. How would we analyze this? We have port 1 and port 2, and they're separated by a distance L. Notice we've connected transmission lines to either port that are the same characteristic impedance as the characteristic impedance inside. What we really have is one continuous transmission line here, and we've made it into a two-port device by simply locating two points along that transmission line and defined it as port 1 and port 2. The salient parameter is the distance between these port definitions, and that is this length uh, L. So what is the scattering uh, scattering matrix for this device? A number of different ways we can go through and analyze this. We need to set up a, a, an experiment. Uh, let's do the first column first. So we're going to find S11 and S21 there. We would terminate this in a match load and we could use telegrapher equations directly there. If we terminate this in a match load we would only have uh, a wave that would be propagating in this direction. Um, there would be no reflected wave back and since there's no discontinuity here uh, they would just continue uh, no reflected wave here or here. It would be simply an incident wave that would continue to propagate down this transmission line since there is no discontinuity. There would be no scattered wave here or scattered wave here. We could simply, once we wrote down the uh, solution to the telegrapher equations, only the plus wave voltage, we could evaluate it here and here immediately and from that determine the scattering parameter. So that's probably the easiest way of doing it. Again, you have to recognize that if I terminate them to match load, my telegrapher equation simply becomes the plus wave voltage at every point before port 1 in the middle between port 1 and port 2 and after uh, port 2 over here evaluate those um, um, evaluate that wave and determine the scattering parameters instead we're going to use uh, a different way we're going to use the match source and match load on this again it'll same give us the same answer but it gives us an opportunity to demonstrate the uh, uh, how we might use the match source and match load for a problem of this nature So what we're going to do then to set up our experiment to find S11 and S21 is we're going to put a match load and a matched uh, source on the two ports. First we put a matched load on port 1 and then we put a matched, I'm sorry, matched source on port 1 and then we put a match load here on port 2. Went ahead and drew, drew an index uh, where Z increasing as we move in this direction. Now this is the index for this transmission line here, not the index uh, for the transmission lines uh, outside of the device. This is the index for this transmission line and I'll make it increasing as we go left to right. I'll arbitrarily define this point as z is equal to zero and therefore this point must be equal to z is equal to minus l since the index has units of distance. Total voltage, port voltage V1 here voltage V2 here. Since this is a transmission line, the uh, telegrapher equations apply for the total current and total voltage along this transmission line. Now there's one very important point that uh, you need to understand. This load, the match load, is numerically equal to Z0. Not because this transmission line has a characteristic impedance Z0. We're not matching Z0 to this. We're matching Z0 to the transmission line on the other side of our port 2 over here. Now yes it was equal to Z0 as well, but that's why this is Z0 because the transmission line that's connected to port 2 has a characteristic impedance of Z0. Likewise over here for the match source we had a transmission line that's connected to the port 1. The characteristic impedance of that transmission line was Z0 and therefore that's why this source impedance is equal to Z0. It's equal to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line that is connected to port 1. This has the same value Z0 but that's not why this is Z0 or why this is Z0. If I made this transmission line three times Z0, in other words, we had a transmission line coming into port one with the characteristic impedance of Z0, one coming connected to port two with the characteristic impedance of Z0, but this 
section in the middle had a characteristic impedance of three times C0, a different value than uh, either of the other two, we would then attach a match load and a match source that again would have this as Z0 and this is Z0. The fact that this the value of this characteristic impedance inside the device has nothing to do with what we set these two values to be. These two values are set by the transmission lines that are connected externally to our device. Now, we look at this and we say, I think I did this before, this looks like something way earlier in the course. We simply have a length of transmission line with a load at the end and a, a source at the beginning. And even simpler, it is a match load at the end and a match source at the beginning. So we can immediately write down our telegrapher equations. We've written them in terms of V0 plus and gamma 0 here as opposed to V0 plus and V0 minus. And again, they're, the two are equivalent. Remember, V0 uh, gamma zero rather is simply V zero minus divided by V zero plus. We do that for total voltage and total current, making sure that we don't ignore the minus sign for the total current. Okay, so what we need to do is apply boundary conditions to determine the unknown values of uh, V zero plus and gamma zero. <clears throat> We're going to find these values in terms of uh, VG, the uh, match source uh, open circuit voltage. Uh, the first boundary condition that we apply is at the end at z is equal to zero, the load is, and there we know gamma zero must be equal to the values of gamma L, and that's because the load is located at z is equal to zero. The load reflection coefficient where the load is located must be equal to gamma L. The load is located at z is equal to zero, and therefore it's equal to gamma zero. This equality is by definition of gamma zero. This equality is the actual boundary condition. The reflection coefficient where the load is located must be equal to gamma L. But of course the load is a match load and gamma L is equal to zero. And so we can say that the reflection coefficient value gamma zero is equal to zero. All right, so that's our boundary condition <clears throat> that we have. And if we insert that result into our total current and total voltage, we get this result. And of course what that says is there is no minus wave voltage or no minus wave when our load reflection coefficient is equal to zero and that's exactly what we would expect. Now what do we do with this? The problem here is we don't know what V0 plus is and we can't use this directly until we find V0 plus in terms of V0, Z, V right VG the open circuit voltage of our match source so that's our next thing is to find V0 plus in terms of VG and we do that with the other boundary condition and that boundary condition is that Z is equal to minus L So we apply the boundary condition at the other end of the transmission line here, uh, where the match source connects here at port 1. This is location Z is equal to minus L. And this is something we've done before, so I kind of uh, wave my hands a little bit here and go quickly. But we know that if we use boundary conditions uh, in terms of uh, KVL and Ohm's law, we find this result, that VG is equal to the voltage across this plus this voltage here. Uh, this voltage, now we know the total voltage and total current for a match load at the end we evaluated at uh, location z is equal to minus l and we get this result be careful the signs here all right minus l we put into a minus j beta z becomes a plus j beta l so be careful when you do that a lot of students will make errors at this point anyway this becomes now the value of vg the important thing here is this is vg in terms of v0 and so we can solve for v0 plus i should say v0 plus and V0 plus is equal to 1 half VG times this complex exponential. So there is our result for V0 plus, and we can insert that back in to find now the total voltage and total current. Now you may ask yourselves, instead of say implying boundary conditions, why didn't we use the accordion? Why didn't we use equivalent circuits? We've used this to great effect where we would take this impedance and then find the input impedance here and then find a voltage division to find these values and then propagate it back. The reason we didn't use um, the, uh, uh, the accordion method, the uh, equivalent circuit method in this case, is we didn't have a special case. L is just some value. If L is a quarter wavelength or half wavelength, something like that, then it becomes easy to find the input impedance. In this case, we just have to find the general answer for line impedance function or the input impedance function, which is that big complex thing with lots of uh, exponentials and, and unpleasant mathematics. So uh, it turns out in this case, it's much easier simply to directly apply boundary conditions. 
So we found from our first boundary condition there was no reflected wave. The total voltage was simply the plus wave voltage. And then we went through the second boundary condition and found this value of V0 plus in terms of VG. And so we insert that in here. And now this becomes uh, uh, our description of the total voltage at every point on that transmission line uh, in terms of the uh, match source voltage VG. So what do we need to do now? Well, we're going to take this and we're going to find the port voltage um, uh, at port 1 and the port voltage at port 2. And we do that simply by evaluating this total voltage here at Z is equal to 0. By KVL, that must be equal to the voltage V2. And evaluate this total voltage now likewise at Z is equal to minus L. By KVL, that is equal to V1. All right, so V1 is equal to the total voltage evaluated at the end of the line, uh, or the beginning of the line here, and when we do that, we get this result, a nice uh, simple VG over 2. Uh, the second voltage, the port 2 voltage, we evaluate at Z is equal to 0 here, and we get this result for total voltage V2. So once again, the hard part of this uh, process where we use a match source and a uh, uh, match load um, it allows us to determine total voltage at the ports very simply uh, using circuit analysis. But now we have to separate those total voltages into two pieces, the incident and the reflected wave. Um, there is uh, no incident wave on port 2 since it's terminated a match load, but there is an incident wave on port 1. Fortunately, we know what that value is. If we evaluate the plus wave voltage at port 1, since we have a match source there, that's simply VG over 2. And therefore, the scattered wave, the minus wave at port 1, is the difference between the total voltage, which we just determined, and the incident voltage, which is VG over 2. And so we insert the answers for both there, and we get a 0. There is no scattered wave from port 1. And again, this makes sense when you think about it. We have a continuum of a transmission line. There's no discontinuity. We have characteristic impedance of Z0 on one side and characteristic impedance of Z0 on the other. There isn't going to be anything scattered because there is no discontinuity there. If we go to the other side, we talk about the scattered wave uh, at port 2. Uh, since there is no incident wave, the uh, scattered wave voltage at port 2 is um, simply the total voltage, which we calculated to be this. So there is a scattered wave voltage, but really what this is, of course, is that the incident wave on port 1 propagates through the, the device, the transmission line, down to port 2 and out the other side. The scattered wave is just a continuum of the propagating wave through that device there. So now we can figure out the values for scattering parameter S11 and S21. Based on their definitions, again, we figured out what the scattered wave is uh, evaluated at port 1, and the incident wave at port 1, the scattered wave at port 2, and likewise the incident wave at port 1. There's only one incident wave, and so we set up our experiment properly, and that allows us to determine the values for S11 and S21. S11 is equal to 0, and S21 turns out to be a complex exponential, e to the minus j beta L. Beta L, of course, is the electrical length of this transmission line. So this is simply the phase shift from one end of the line to the, uh, to the other. So a very simple set of scattering parameters. Yet this is only one experiment. This gives us the first column of our scattering matrix. What about the second column? So the second column we can find immediately from the values of the first because of a symmetry argument. Our transmission line has a plane of bilateral symmetry, uh, D sub 1 symmetry, uh, uh, order of 2, group order of 2, uh, where one of the elements is reflection. 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, and therefore S11 is equal to S22, and S21 uh, uh, is equal to S 1, 2. And so we can immediately write down the other two elements by using symmetry arguments. We could also write down this result here using reciprocity arguments as well. And so we find the complete scattering matrix for our transmission line is equal to this. There's some interesting things about this when we look at it. One is that the diagonal elements are both equal to zero. What this means is that a length of a transmission line when connected into a, um, uh, a immersed in a system uh, whose characteristic impedance is equal to its own is a matched device. Now we'll find later if the uh, characteristic impedance of that transmission line is different than the characteristic impedance of the lines attached to it, different than the uh, system that it's immersed in, then it, it won't be a match. 
match device. But in this case, it is a match uh, device, quote unquote match device. Uh, we can place it into a match system and preserve a conjugate match uh, regardless of the length of that line. And so um, again, we can find that because the diagonal elements are equal to zero. If we go through and look at this matrix, likewise, we find that it is a unitary matrix. The magnitude of each column is equal to 1. That's pretty simple to see. We get um, uh, the magnitude of the first element is 0, and the magnitude of uh, the second element is 1. And so uh, 0 plus 1, or 0 squared plus 1 squared, would give us 1 for both of these columns there. And if we go through and take the uh, uh, dot product, the inner product of each of them, we, say that we see they're orthogonal. 0 times that is 0, this times 0 is 0, we add zeros together, we get 0, so they're orthogonal. So this is a uh, unitary matrix, and of course from that we conclude that this device is lossless. Uh, of course we knew that, it's a length of lossless transmission line. If the uh, scattering matrix was not unitary, then we knew they could use that as a sanity check, we would know we made a mistake if the result was not unitary, because a lossless uh, length of transmission line by definition is a lossless device.